Hey everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the CNC Base Camp. Now, if you're a woodworker, a model builder, a maker, if you have a love for CNC routers, then this is the show for you. My name is Chris Fitch. I'm the creative director for Woodsmith Magazine. And each month, I'm gonna bring you a new episode of the CNC Base Camp. We'll start with a topic that's relevant to CNC routers. And once we've discussed that topic, we're gonna to build a project together and demonstrate what we've learned. Now, if you like the project, it's going to be available to you in a free DXF download. Can't beat that. Once we're done with the project, there'll always be a question and answer and comment section. So if you would like to drop us a line with a question, a comments, and thoughts, that sure appreciate it. Well, let's go ahead and get started with our very first episode, and today's topic is cutting plywood. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com. You know, I cut a lot of different materials on my CNC router. Brass, solid wood, plastic, aluminum. The one I cut more than any of all is plywood. And so I thought it would be a great topic today to learn how to cut plywood properly with all the different bits that are available to us. So today I'd like to look at discuss and demonstrate a straight router bit, an up cut, a down cut, and a compression router bit. Before we start talking about individual router bits, let's talk a little bit about how you would select a router bit for your job. Now, one of the problems that we have with CNC routers is bit deflection and vibration. We always want to minimize that. And one of the ways we can do that is by careful selection of the router bit. What I mean is, Take a look at this bit. That is a one inch long cutter length. Now I'm going to be cutting three quarters of an inch thick plywood. So I want a bit that's long enough to do its job, but not, is not overly long. Also take a look at the overall length of the bit. That's about two and a half inches. I don't want a lot of shank hanging beneath the collet because that extra shank, just like the extra length of the cutter, is an invitation to vibration. So keep the cutter length short, keep the overall length short, and that'll make for a better cut. Another simple way to get great results out of your router is to take good care of it, and in particular, the collet. We want to make sure that our collet is blown clean and free of any buildup. Also, make sure your threads are clean on the spindle, and I've taken to using a commercial compound and getting up inside the cone and making sure that's nice and clean. It'll make a big difference in keeping your bits centered. Now, if you're someone who uses a one horsepower commercial router in your CNC, I'd like to suggest that you might think about a collet upgrade. This is one that I purchased, and it came with a 1 8 inch collet, a 1 quarter inch collet, and a high precision collet nut. I think it makes a great difference in the way my router performs. The last thing we need to talk about before we start actually demonstrating these router bits is chip calculations. You know, I know everybody's eyes kind of roll when we think about the math involved. The chip calculation number is derived from the feed rate in inches per minute divided by the RPM times the number of flutes in a router bit. And it's simply a way of getting it close to an ideal number for the RPM and feed for a router bit. Now, why do we care? Well, we care because we want the best quality cut we can and we don't want to turn our router bit into a smoldering mess. Heat is the killer of router bits, and so we want to minimize heat. And we do that by minimizing the number of actual cuts that the router bit needs to make, and we do that by making sure that the chips are as large as possible, because large chips carry the heat away from the router bit more efficiently than small ones do. So chips and not dust, that's what we're after. Now you can do all the math, but I'll give you a couple numbers to start with. Now, I should note that I am using nasty Baltic birch plywood. I love the stuff, but it's got a lot of glue lines and it's very dense, so my numbers reflect that. A good place to start with plywood is an RPM of about 17,500 and a feed rate of approximately 80 inches per minute. If you can increase the feed rate, well, then do so. 
If you're cutting, say, a ply core A2, you should be able to run it about 120 inches per minute. For my Baltic birch plywood, I've got to cut that back. Now, remember the depth of the cut really has nothing to do with our chip clearance numbers. The depth of cut is simply a factor of the horsepower of your router, your materials, other things. A good place to start on the depth of cut is one half of the diameter of your bit. So for a quarter inch router bit, the depth of cut is going to be one eighth of an inch. Now that's going to hold true for my down cut, my up cut, and my straight bit, but not for the compression bit, and I'll talk about that later. To demonstrate the attributes of our router bits, I'm going to have each one, the up cut, the down cut, the straight, and the compression be used to route a sample board. And in that board, there'll be a pocket cut and a profile cut. And with that, we'll be able to see exactly how they perform. The first bit I'm going to use is a straight bit. Now, the straight router bit is the old workhorse of the workshop. And what's wonderful about a straight bit is the geometry. The cutter engages the workpiece in an entirely neutral angle. It doesn't lift it up, it doesn't push it down. So overall, it produces a very clean cut without a lot of chipping. The downside with a straight bit is it doesn't lift the chips out very well, so it can be a little bit slow. But overall, it's a good performer. If you've used your CNC router much, you're probably already pretty familiar with the UpCut Spiral router bit. It's a great bit. One of the advantages of the UpCut router bit is that it pulls chips out of the cut. And that really helps with router speed and it helps with efficiency. One of the downsides of the UpCut router bit is it can be a little hard on the top surface of plywoods. You get a lot of chipping and also solid woods. But that UpCut motion of pulling the chips out does make it a favorite for solid woodwork. So woodworkers love their UpCut spirals. One advantage of the spiral as well is that it will leave the bottom face of your workpiece fairly clean. That UpCut motion helps to pull the fibers of the wood into the cut, so not much chipping. As far as speed, it's a good performer. So it's a real workhorse in the workshop, as long as you're not picky about that top surface. The downcut router bit looks a lot like the upcut spiral, until you look a little more closely. You'll notice that the helix actually runs in the opposite direction. So as the downcut router bit spins, it is pushing chips down into the workpiece. That might sound a little counterproductive, but the advantage of a downcut router bit is that that shearing action severs the fibers cleanly on the top surface of our workpiece. So it will leave a beautiful surface up top. Now as it cuts through the workpiece, that downward spiral is going to fray and splinter some of the bottom edge, but the top will really look good. Now as I said, it does tend to push chips down into the workpiece, and that means we have to use a very slow feed rate. It's a disadvantage, and we don't want to use the downcut too much, but if you want top performance with that upper surface, downcut bit is the way to go. Compression router bits are interesting. They're made specifically for sheet goods. And they're interesting because they marry both the downcut and the upcut spiral. So the bottom of a compression bit is an upcut. So it's pulling upwards. But the balance of the router bit is a downcut. Now, here's the thing about that. Think about cutting a piece of plywood. We want that downward action on the top surface. We want that upward action on the bottom. And that's what you get with a compression router bit. You get good results on the top. You get good results on the bottom. One thing about using a compression router bit in a small machine, typically the upcut section is only about an eighth of an inch long. Then the two start to marry, and you move to the downcut section. So in order to get good results as we start our cut, we need to plunge that router bit past the upcut and into the downcut geometry. So I had mentioned earlier that a good depth of cut is about one half the diameter of the router bit, or an eighth of an inch. Well, with a compression bit, we have to go a little bit deeper. So on our demonstration pieces, I'm going to be starting at a 3 16 depth of cut. And that's to make sure that we get down into the downcut geometry and I have good results with the top surface of my plywood. It's a great bit to use for any sheet good, and I think you'll see some good results here. Let's take a look at them and see how they did. 
Looking at the straight router bit sample, it's a nice clean cut along the edges. There's a little bit of fuzz here and there, but overall, I tell you, it's a nice cut. A bit of sanding, I think it's perfectly acceptable. Looking at the down cut sample, we've got nice edges. It did a fantastic job on the lettering. Smooth bottom, really no fuzz at all around the letters. It's very nice. The upcut router bit sample looks, well, it just looks awful. There's all sorts of tear out around the letters. And that's just not a little bit of fuzz you can stand away. It's actually torn back into the surface. Back looks pretty good though. Taking a look at the compression bit sample, got a nice smooth edge. The back looks pretty good on it. And the front looks great too. So if you want good results, both front and back, use the compression bit. It's a winner. Well, I've got a great project for you to put your knowledge about plywood cutting to work. These little stackable sawhorses have been a real hit around here. Our designer, Dylan Baker, has already claimed this set for his bench. One of the other guys has a set in his shop, but two of them have been painted with milk paint, so they're used by the family to reach those high places. The sawhorses themselves are very simple. There are two end panels to cut, a top, a shelf, and then some added supports for both the top and the shelf. The place I'm going to start to build these is it going to be on the computer. I'm going to go ahead and model them in three dimensions. To create our sawhorse project, I'm using a 3D CAD program called Autodesk Inventor. Autodesk Inventor allows me to create individual parts, bring them into an assembly, and then constrain them together to represent the final project. Create the DXF files that we will need to then create the G-code. I need to open an individual part. In this case, this is the end of the sawhorse. I then create a sketch on the end that has the information that I need, and that information is highlighted. So here you can see I've highlighted the lines that create the dados that house the top and the shelf you'll also see screw hole locations. From that sketch, I can then export a DXF file, or vector file, into my next program that I'm going to use. To create the G-code, I'm using vCarve Pro. There are certainly many programs out there that will do the same thing. The first step that I'm going to take is to create a pocket cut in order to cut out the dados that house the top and the shelf. One issue that I have is that the bit cannot cut into a tight small corner. So I've drawn rectangles which shoot past the sides and past the top of the part so that the bit will fully clear and fully cut out these dados. On a different layer you can see the outline of the end. You'll also notice here are the screw holes. The quarter inch bit that I'm using is too large to draw at the screw holes, but I can use it to mark their location, which is very helpful. To set this up, I'm going to use a function specifically for drilling tool paths. And you can see it's highlighted now. Each of those holes will be drilled 0.05 inches to mark the location. The last tool path to set up is a profile cut around the perimeter of our part. As you can see, I've selected a compression bit for my profile cut since we found that it was such a good bit for two-sided cutting. There are a series of other choices to make. Then I hit Create and vCarve Pro will create a G-code instruction sheet for our CNC router. Well, I finished cutting the parts out for my sawhorses. I went ahead and cut the ends on my CNC router, and I also cut the top and the shelf. 
Now the top and the shelf did require that I go to the table saw and cut a 15 degree bevel on them. If you'd like to, go ahead and cut the top and the shelf exclusively on your table saw. It's a little more efficient of wood, but I like using my CNC router. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention to you, I took off the dust collection for, from our CNC router so you could get a little better of an idea of what was happening with all of our cutting and bit testing, but normally it would be there. So I think it's time for me to gather my parts together and start putting together my first sawhorse. Assembling the stacking sawhorses is a pretty easy affair. The first thing I'm going to do is put glue into these datas that we've cut and then add one of these supports driving it in place. Next I'm going to add some glue into the dados on our end. Nice thing about using the CNC machine, generally we get a pretty precise fit. With everything in place, I'm just going to flip it up and set our sawhorse on its legs. And now let's add a few clamps. After checking to make sure everything is aligned properly, all I need to do now is pre-drill each hole because we are going into the edge of plywood and then I'll add a one and three quarter inch screw. And there we go, there's our first sawhorse. I think what I'm gonna do next is wait for the glue to dry, give it a light sanding, and then give it a couple coats of clear finish to protect it. And with that, it'll be a great accessory to the house and to my workshop. Well, it's time for the question, answers, and comments portion of the show. I get a lot of questions about CNC work here at Woodsmith Magazine. And one that I recently got was from Charles who asked me, how do I change the direction of the stepper motors on my CNC machine? Well, it's pretty easy. So let's take a look at this machine here. Right now, my origin point is in this corner of the machine. So when the gantry sweeps forward, it's moving in a positive X direction. I'll show you. So if I want to change the direction of that motor, how do I do it? Well, the easiest way is to go into our program which controls the machine, and that's Mach 3. To change the direction of a stepper motor in Mach 3, we begin by going to Configurations, then to Ports and Pins, and finally to Motor Outputs. You'll see this column here which lists the x-axis, y, and z. In this case, I'd like to change the direction of the x-axis. I simply go over to the Direct Low Active heading and click. Now I'm going to hit Apply, OK. I'll reset, and when I go over to my jog buttons and press X Plus, 
the gantry should sweep backwards now from what it was. And it is. The Mach 3 is now set up so that positive x is in the opposite direction than it was. So it's that easy. You could also change the direction of the stepper motor by changing the wiring. Stepper motors have two coils. If you simply reverse the polarity of one of the coils, you'll change the motor's direction. So, two easy ways to change the direction of a stepper motor. The preferred method is to go into Mach 3 and go through that sequence and do it that way. I received another CNC related question this past week and the question was what types of plastic work well with the CNC router? Well really there are two. One is acrylic and the other is polyethylene. You're probably already familiar with acrylic in the flexible sheeting that's often used on windows. Extruded acrylic is typically 3 eighths of an inch or less and it tends to be what we might call soft plastic. Cast acrylic comes in thicknesses up to four inches and it's typically termed a hard plastic. The only difference between a hard and a soft plastic is the tooling that we might use for them. A hard plastic we're going to want to use a bit like this. This is a two flute straight quarter inch bit and the geometry is different than the bit that would be used for cutting wood. If you're carving acrylic I'd suggest cast acrylic. Go for the harder plastic. This is a 16th inch ball nose taper bit that you would use for the finished cut and it has two flutes. When you're cutting plastic, go with only two flutes. Another great plastic you may want to consider is ultra high molecular density polyethylene. You may already be using some right now in your shop. Sometimes it's used for jigs or faces on table saw or router fences. Ultra high molecular density polyethylene is very easy to work with CNC router bits. Choose a bit that you would use for cast acrylic, in other words a hard plastic. A two flute bit like this and perhaps a carving bit with only two flutes. Another variation of this type of plastic is high density polyethylene. Now high density polyethylene has the advantage of coming in a couple of different colors and it's also UV resistant. So if you've got a part to make for your boat, your truck, for outside, high density polyethylene would be the way to go. Works beautifully. So either way, acrylic or polyethylene, they're affordable and they work very well with a CNC router. Well that wraps up today's episode. Remember there's a free DXF file waiting for you to download of today's project. If you have any questions or comments that you'd like to forward to us, send them in. Love to hear from you. So join me next month for another episode of CNC Basecamp. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com.